Okay, we are live everywhere also. So it's five fifty-seven. In just a couple of minutes, we'll just get started. Sure. Krutika is facing some problems, so till the time she joins, I'll fill in her. <laughs> Okay, so friends, some of you are already on live on Zoom. We'll get started with our discussion at six PM, but just a couple of introductions. So we have some uh, people who are live with us on Zoom, and a lot of other people who are watching our Facebook live, YouTube live, or Twitter live. So in case if you have any questions, you can ask those questions. We'll take up those questions towards the second half of the session. Uh, and on uh, LinkedIn also there is a thread, so uh, you can reach out to each of the speaker or uh, ask questions over there. And we, in a minute, we'll just get started. And one other thing we will, so if you can ask a question right now, live on Zoom, uh, probably towards the second half, I can have some of you actually speak up. Uh, but if your question is very clear, that will give us a better clarity on whom to allow to speak up. Okay, so it's almost 6 p.m. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining in. I'm Jatin. I'm one of the co-founder of HI Network. Uh, this is this program is part of Korai Summit, which HI Network and Vadani Foundation are organizing. Uh, in this summit, there are a lot of interesting uh, tracks. So the first day was more of a sectorial track where there are prominent founders from a particular uh, hot favorite sector. Haltech is the one which is on the focus uh, now uh, after the pandemic situation. Uh, so, and we have a lot of prominent founders who are joining. So thank you so much, uh, uh, all our panelists for accepting the invite and committing your time to spend with us. Uh, Ankit, if you can briefly tell us about Vadwani Foundation, what it does, and then we'll get started with our session. Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for joining in. Uh, Vadwani Foundation is a US-based not-for-profit foundation working with a very special uh, focus mission on creating high-value jobs. Pleasure to have everyone here on board with us. Awesome. Uh, so we'll, uh, so the format of the session would be we have uh, amazing speakers uh, who joined in. So they'll briefly introduce themselves and there are some questions and then we'll take some audience questions. Uh, so, Rachna, if you can just briefly introduce you, your firm, and your background, and then we'll get started with our other session. Yeah. Sure. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I think health tech and femtech today is actually taking center stage, more so at a time when the entire world is grappling with pandemic. I don't think it could have been a better time to talk about um, healthcare. And so thank you to Jatin and the Ichai Network for hosting this very pertinent session today. I'm Rachna Gupta, the co-founder of Gaino Veda, which is the world's first digital platform combining Ayurveda and technology to solve period problems. We are an early stage startup. Uh, it's been less than a year since the three founders, uh, and I'm fortunate to have with me by my side, my husband and my uh, founder and CEO and along with our doctor partner, who is an MD obstetrics and gynecologist, um, we got into the space of Gynoveda because we clearly identified the need to, uh, to be the category leader in the space of menstrual health. Uh, so what our vision is to actually disrupt uh, the need to go out and have any kind of a physical examination and that's what we bring on board through technology. Uh, we've enabled technology through the world's first period bot. So if you go on to gynoveda.com today, a woman anywhere in the world, just through her mobile can answer 23 questions. And there is a bot which indicates her chances of having any specific menstrual disorder. Uh, and then the solution is provided through our Ayurveda supplements. So it's been a very enriching journey right from 
at beta testing phase uh, exactly same time last year uh, to then uh, identifying a very clear product market fit uh, and then pitching to certain uh, institutional investors and glad to have with us in this journey a fireside ventures who is one of the marquee um, vcs in the country backing gyno veda so what it clearly gives us is uh, a very strong backing in terms of being able to make a difference in the lives of millions of women today who are affected with menstrual disorders and to be able to normalize conversations around a topic which is still considered to be a taboo in some parts of india so i think digital penetration has made uh, accessibility and um, affordability easy but we still need to normalize conversations in a lot of indian households and to be able to give women the tools and the know how to go out there and seek help for their menstrual problems uh, so i'm glad that through gynoveda we are able to address one of the you know not so openly discussed but the need of the hour and uh, our vision is to go out there and uh, capitalize this entire life cycle of a woman's menstrual health and reproductive health awesome thank you so much rishna krutika is already in i'll just have one more introduction and krutika then you take over the <laughs> introduction Questions. part so, yeah. uh, An anu uh, thank you so much for joining in we read stories about you uh, as an inspiring founder and what innovative stuff you do uh, if you can briefly uh, introduce yourself and about the map my genome yep yeah. thanks jatin uh, i am anu acharya i'm the founder of uh, map my genome i've been an entrepreneur now for over 20 years uh my first company was osimo bio and uh, about 7 years ago i thought that there was uh, the number of uh, you know data points for indian uh, in the genomic space this was very less so we are about 80% of the world's population and we are only getting about 0.2% of the data so that is why we started map my genome and uh, we decided to bring it to the average indian consumer by using words that they were familiar with so we started off with a product called genome patri which is a word play on the janam patri and uh, we've been able to create this whole awareness about uh, preventive health we we were doing a lot of work on both clinical genetics but also on preventive genetics uh, but about 2 3 months ago when covid hit we also took another pivot uh, we we have become a high throughput covid testing lab as well and i think for us it's a great opportunity to be able to combine both what we do on the genetics front but also from a clinical side we now have the uh, ability to be able to put both of those together and actually do something much more valuable for them so early on we uh, in march april we came up with something that uh, allowed people to understand the immunity and risks associated based on covid and now i think uh, we are i think in some phase of transformation as a company itself awesome uh, mari it is a late night in australia and thank you so much for joining in uh, just brief introduction and uh, about you and your firm oh it's a pleasure to be here and I, i'm honored to be invited by korai so i'm really enjoying um uh, looking at listening to all the stories and the backgrounds it's such a important area um and and so needed right now you know health tech and and femtech and and i'm 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 grateful to have this forum to acknowledge that um how i got here is um my background is actually technology um i've been involved in technology my whole life and uh, managed quite large implementations in large organizations and government um but it was actually my uh husband that 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 enlightened me to um what was happening in digital health he was involved in the digital health space in in australia and um and i looked what was planned with digital health information and um and i realized that it was mainly being provided for doctors and and hospitals at the time and and not really accessible to people themselves and and so i just wondered what would happen if people could actually know what was in their health records how would that make their, them feel because the problem we have is that you know people and and in particular people with chronic illness are seeing multiple doctors all the time and they're repeating the same information over and over and and they don't necessarily communicate very well and often it takes them many years to get diagnosed 
And what if we can empower people with that information and change that dynamic and, and, and maybe make it so that it's easier for people to get diagnosed if they're communicating the right information and also make it easier for the doctors involved as well. So I guess that's, that's where we're coming from. There's certainly many challenges because guess what? The main thing that people are using right now is paper and manila folders and, you know, Google Drives and, and things like that. So there's no real one place where people are actually keeping this information if they do keep it at all. And, and so uh, they're not very well informed and information is scattered everywhere. So the challenge we, one of the big challenges that we have is that people are not very digital in their own personal health needs at the moment. And so we have quite a big education factor here. So anyone going along this journey, that's that's an assumption that people think because for everyone's digital and everything else you know we're we're on the phone for our socials we do banking but we're not really we might have a fitbit or an apple watch but but that's as far as it goes all right so this is actually quite a significant change and a social change for people to start getting personal with their health information and start actually keeping track but starting collecting i say it's like a bank account when you have nothing in there, mm. it's really not useful and you don't know what to do or you can't do anything with it. But if you start collecting your health information and starting using that to help yourself, then that's that's the journey that we have. Awesome. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Thank um, you so much. So We'll have, Lisa, your introduction and then Krutika will take over the session. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, Lisa, your introduction. Yeah. Hello, hello. I'm Lisa Pape. I'm based in London and Copenhagen, and I'm working in the field of wearables, specifically in the area of mobility. So uh, I started about six years ago on working on devices to help people to be able to walk better. Initially, the focus has been on Parkinson's disease, uh, where we have created a laser shoe that can help people overcome a specific symptom. Uh, it's a medical device. So through this journey, we've been going through clinical studies as well as a lot of development. And now we're working on a second product, which is for diabetes. It's an insole that provides a vibrational feedback to improve balance. And it can also track how the person is walking to identify risk patterns and so on. Awesome. With this, my guest appearance is over. Kritika, screen is yours. <laughs> right. Thank you, Lisa, for your introduction. I'm audible to everyone. Yes. Yes. Right. Uh, so um, a very, very good evening to Rachna and um, Sanu and uh, uh, welcome Marie and Lisa also. Uh, my first question will be, I think uh, what we'll try to uh, uh, do here is we'll go for a question and answer format. We'll try to stick to answers for one, one and a half minutes so that each speaker gets uh, uh, enough time to share their views. So I think my first question is to Rachna that uh, how did you uh, decide that you wanted to work in menstrual health or in, in this particular, because health tech is so vast. So um, why you decided as menstrual cycle as one of the important uh, health issues or health aspects on which you wanted to work on and start Gynoveda? Thank you, I love this question. So uh, there's, a, there's a backstory to this, uh, Kritika, and, you know, over my last 20 years of corporate experience before I jumped into the entrepreneurial bandwagon, I've always worked in very big women-centric teams. And uh, of course, during my entire, uh, you know, experience, I've realized that one of the areas that we as women don't pay enough attention to is our own health, right? I mean, yeah. in the stack of things, we tend to place ourselves last in terms of priority. And within that also, when it comes to menstrual health, we'll be dealing with period pain, we'll be dealing with vaginal uh, discharge issues, we'll be dealing with delayed periods, but there is so much of apprehension to open up and really talk right. to uh, your best friend or your mother or your sister, because you also fear about being judged. Judge. So this is something that I used to constantly experience firsthand from my teams. And uh, at that point of time, then I didn't know that there is going to be a space that, you know, I would venture into. Right. What I definitely knew is 
that I wanted to do something when it comes to women's health. Also mm. during that period when I was moving out of the corporate world and wanted to make a difference in the lives of women, by then my mm. husband and I, uh, who are both co-founders, we, had, we were huge Ayurveda advocates. So okay. we had already seen significant difference, I would say rather transformational differences in our life and a paradigm shift in terms of how we were reaping the benefits of Ayurveda for lifestyle disorders. So Vishal, my husband, was battling with psoriasis, which is an autoimmune disorder. Mm -hmm. And he had tried everything yeah. and miserably failed. But when he adopted an Ayurveda way of living, it brought about a huge change uh, in his relief and also his overall health and wellness and so yeah. when i saw those benefits firsthand i was sure that there would be secrets in ayurveda which would be so powerful and magical that that needs to get deployed into the menstrual space and i'm glad today that in hindsight we decided to stick to it because it's a massive landscape uh, and to be able to yeah. give women the power to diagnose themselves and then treat themselves uh, and come out of right. period problems. In fact, I call it as freedom from period problems. I think it just gives them wings to fly, to be able to travel, to be right. able to pursue their dreams. Um, and so actually that's, that's how we decided to build the space. Right, Rachna, you were, uh, it's really true that a lot of women in reproductive age group are going to uh, battle with their periods for a long duration of time. And as you said, Ayurveda is indeed uh, not only just getting its resurgence in India, but also in different parts of the world, it's getting acceptance. So why not, uh, you know, bring those solutions at a greater scale to women? Uh, I think my, thank you so much for your answer. Uh, my next uh, question would be to Ms. Anu. Um, so Map My Genome, uh, being somebody who uh, ha you have been an inspiration to me as well when I started with my journey as an author entrepreneur in health space. Uh, genomics was a very uh, unique concept for India and that too in application or in diagnostics. So how did you decide that, okay, I need to bring it to a commercial space as a business and out of from lab to uh, actual application to people's lives? So how did you step into that journey? Thank, thanks, Kritika. I think uh, for us, the, you know, it was more for Map My Genome, it was more something that I had been doing for a while. So I would say that 20 years ago, I had no idea what I was getting into. I think at that point, uh, when I started Osinom, it was more uh, the first time the human genome was just about getting sequenced. So it was something brand new for the entire world. Yes, uh, yes. So, so that time it was exciting right. from a, you know, it was just uh, intellectually challenging. It was something that would, would keep us engaged for a while. So that's why we started Osimum. But I think when you look at Map My Genome, I think it is, uh, it was basically after having been in the industry for a while, you start to see what is happening in the world. And one of the areas that was uh, yeah. definitely, you know, getting a lot of attention was precision medicine. And we were working a lot with the large pharmaceutical and biotech companies across the globe. And we were doing a little as a service for, for all of them. But when we looked at what we were doing, both from a services point of view, but also from the databases that we had, that we were, uh, we were selling to, to these companies, uh, the amount of data that was in these databases was very, very uh, uh, heavily focused towards the Caucasian population. So there was very little data that right. was there for the Indian population. And when we are saying that it is going to be targeted for individuals, I think that was sort of where we said, you know, it, it makes more sense for us to focus on the Indian population. So that's right. why, you know, I started Map My Genome. And I think in Map My Genome, it was clearly in the first few years, I think was a lot of education to the average consumer. You suddenly have to start, you know, we were used to talking to the VP of Translation and Sciences, Bioinformatics. Right people who are right. far, far smarter than what we were doing mm -hmm. on the regular scientists. basis. Scientists. Correct. Mostly yeah. scientists. And now suddenly we had to educate the average consumer. So mm -hmm. you realize that it was a very different, even though the technology was the same, I think there was a huge difference in terms of what we were right. trying to sell to the average consumer. But I think it was, it's been challenging. And I think today, uh, thanks to COVID, 
uh, everybody understands what's a swab, what's DNA, what's RNA. And uh, I think it has helped us a lot in getting people to understand what we've been doing for the last 20 years and that prevention is important and that your genetic composition is, is as important as everything else in trying to understand and make sure that you can make those lifestyle changes. So I think for me, that was sort of the motivation to, to get started. Yeah. No, genomics is extremely important for predictive uh, therapies and targeted medical medicine approach. And uh, I think I have had my own experience with genomics while I was uh, working in basic research before I came into this. So it's extremely important for uh, not only research purpose, big pharma, but also uh, I think that's where our diagnostics is going to you know, progress next. Uh, thank you so much for your answer. Uh, I think the same question to Marie. Uh, so Marie, um, how did you decide that, okay, Fitbit, uh, Fitbit is the max uh, digitization that people are uh, going into when it comes to health tech and how did you recognize those points which also need to be digitized for an individual's health and uh, Wangi came into Wangi sorry Wangi came into existence so yeah thank you um, I it, it was actually my, my thought process was that your health is is about all of you, not just, you know, it, when when you go to the doctor, you know, the doctor wants to know what's been happening with you, right? It's, it's, it's you know, depending what you're going for, you know, is it, is it um, something where they want to know your symptoms? But it might also be about, you know, that it might be about your diet, it might be about your exercise, it might be about your treatment plan. There's so many things that you get asked when you go to the doctors that you have to repeat every time um, and you become the messenger, right? Um, mm. I particularly saw this. Um, uh, this is another reason why I continued on this journey is a very close friend of mine was diagnosed with breast cancer and she just said how, you know, she was going to, you know, one doctor and then, then she would be sent on a path of going to get tests and this specialist and then another one and, and so on. And then they would all have different opinions and they'd asked her for what, what happened at the last appointment. And, you know, the, the, the information hadn't necessarily been passed on or she'd have to go and have the tests again or she would have to um, make decisions about certain medication as to be, whether it was good for her or not. And, and so... You know, what I saw there was that, you know, she was really struggling, really grappling with the whole, you know, healthcare system. It's a system, you know, it's a, it's a massive beast that we feel we can't control it, right? And so I, I just felt that, um, you know, if there was a way that we could, we could uh, you know, start getting access to that and, and get, yeah. you know, getting some control back. I just felt a, a big need to do that. I mean, my husband said to me, you know, like it's it's a difficult problem working with digital health and the healthcare system. Sure, sure. But um, I, I think it's worth it because, you know, when you have a conversation with someone who starts feeling, wow, I actually was able to provide my history to my doctor at that last appointment and he or she said, oh, actually that's what's been going on, right? right. And there's that was the, just... Just little things like that. It's very rewarding. And and that's what I guess if I can help, just that's little how, rewards like that. That right. that's, that's what, what kept going. going. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Actually, it's a very uh, crucial problem, even back in India, where uh, hardly people we still get those uh, uh, paper reports. And often, even in my family, I've seen that they don't remember when they started having some health issue. So Digitization can be one of the first steps where people don't have to remember stuff, but also they have an entire record of what their health has been at one point of time in their life, some point of time in their life. Uh, I think the same question to you, Lisa, how uh, did you come into this health tech space? What was your inspiration or prime motivation? Yes, yeah, so um, I actually have a background studying human biology 
Mm-hmm. So health tech was kind of a natural, a natural area for me, I guess. Right. Um, initially, after studying that, I thought I might become a researcher, but then decided that wasn't quite the, the avenue I wanted to, to take. So I ventured off into a couple of other areas, including finance and advertising. Um, and then I actually decided to do a postgraduate course in innovation design engineering. Uh, and then I wanted to kind of get back to healthcare because it was always a passion of mine. But I wanted to find a new way to engage in healthcare that wasn't you know, cell-based or um, that kind of science in a laboratory. Uh, So that was part of it. And then in addition to that, um, my father has had Parkinson's for many years. So that was also a a reason for me to kind of look at mobility and look at some of the areas surrounding that condition and how, how it affects daily life. So I used more of a kind of design approach to start really by looking at daily life issues uh, in these conditions. Uh, And I came to find, you know, there's a lot of symptoms that aren't necessarily treated. And I think there's a lot of focus uh, in Parkinson's as well on finding a cure, which is great. But I think uh, we can't miss all the other people who are currently living and breathing in this space. So, uh, So that was the starting point, wanting to find solutions that were positive without some of the negative side effects that can surround drug treatment. Right. Thank you, Lisa. I think what uh, what I found common in uh, Rachna, Marie, and Lisa's answer is how your personal experiences and people around you do impact uh, and do work as a motivation for your, what you really want to do ultimately with your life and with your career. I think I will move uh, swiftly to my next question, and that is the challenges. So uh, I won't call you as female entrepreneurs because I believe an entrepreneur is an entrepreneur. So, but then still with the space and with the kind of situation you were in personally and professionally, what were your challenges in coming where you are today? Rachna, please, please start with you. I think challenges is, uh, yeah, and I'm so glad you didn't say female entrepreneurs, yeah. right? Like I always joke that why do we only say mompreneurs? Where are the dadpreneurs? Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so oh, challenges have been plenty. I, um, I think right from the ideation stage, right? So while we were very clear that we had narrowed down to uh, menstrual health and wanting to be category leader in the menstrual health and reproductive health, but how do you digitize the product? So when I, you know, I just mentioned about the um, period test that we've built, and it's a revolutionary period test because it's the first of its kind uh, where there's a period bot which indicates what menstrual disorder a woman could have. So right. I think right from uh, getting the product out in a desired format, there were challenges at that point of time. Um, but one thing that we were very clear is that we want to move forward. There's no looking back, right? There is, there is constant motivation to say, okay, okay, I've achieved something today. Let me build upon it and take it to the next level. Right. Uh, and then, of course, there were also challenges when we decided that uh, this business needs to have a certain element of funds. It needs to have the right growth partners. I'm not going sure. to call them as investors, but the sure. right growth partners. So challenges in terms of constantly pitching uh, and I think mm. I heard a lot of no's in this journey yeah. until yeah. we found the right growth partner. But I'm thankful and grateful to the no's that we've got because that made us go back to the drawing board, tweak right. uh, what we had to. One thing that though uh, that didn't change though in this journey is our core offering. We were very clear that the model that we've built had come from an authentic need to solve a problem. Uh, And so irrespective of what people would say, okay, why don't you change your Ayurveda model and make it a hybrid model? Why don't you include allopathy? Why don't you include homeopathy and give women the choice to decide? Mm. Uh, But I think we we stuck to our instincts. And for an entrepreneur uh, with whatever limited experience I have, I think your instincts are always right. So if you know the core of what you are doing, and if you're able to stick to your ground, however challenging I think the journey is, eventually it's going to go into your favor. True, true. I think instincts and what you really want to offer is something very few people understand. 
in in this space but i think you uh, are really lucky that you found fireside ventures who can support your vision uh, i think my next question will be to ms anu because i think your product uh, with you we all already have one question on customer awareness but i'll not directly uh, push you to the answer but what were your challenges Uh, so I think it yeah, was a new yeah, like yeah, yeah, got it. Uh, so I think in in many ways uh, challenges are what fuel uh, uh, an entrepreneur's journey, right? So I right. think that's what gets us started. And for us, I think uh, some of the early challenges were obviously on customer awareness because uh, you know neither doctors understood what we were trying to do, nor yeah. the average consumer. So I think one was to to say how do you simplify your uh, you know your whole business purpose. uh in a way that an average person can understand and i think that helped us tremendously in in the company we have become now uh so i understanding what a consumer can understand getting down to level is a very important aspect because right. otherwise you can use as many buzzwords as you want uh, right. and not be able to get through to them right. so that is definitely one part of what uh, has happened over the years like uh, whether it was by doing constant uh, explanations through you know conferences whether it was uh, doing it blogs or, or whatever they be prepared to do it or through cmes each one of them adds up and i think slowly it becomes easier to be able to spread it across and i think today it's much easier than it was 7 years ago yes yes so that was definitely the first one of it the second was uh, on um, when you're in a cutting edge technology space like genomics you have this constant uh, you know there is a constant change that has happening whether it is in terms of the amount of data you can understand and how you crunch and so on and i think all of that helps us in becoming a company that can sort of analyze large amounts of data and be able to do that you know in the most efficient manner i think all challenges whether it is funding challenges or otherwise i think change dna expresses in, in many ways right, right. So, uh, for us i think it has uh, there have been many challenges and i think some will be to everybody on this panel and and all the people who are watching it but uh, i think when you are in a slightly advanced technology space where the science is constantly changing where uh, the awareness is low i think the thrill of being able to actually be able to get that uh, across to an average consumer i think that is is the most exciting part right. but how the way you pointed that digitization has actually helped uh, to make consumer awareness uh, much conduct those campaigns in much easier way you can reach more people in less amount of time and i think i received lot of emails from map my genome to be honest so yes <laughs> you are gradually reaching to your customer base in one way or the other as compared to 7 years before i agree that now it's much easier to do a lot of things to reach out to people uh hi mary same question to you what were your challenges uh, when you decided uh, to come on this journey uh there's definitely funding and uh, well growth challenges I, i like how you uh, you you called it that um uh, for uh, many women um in in um that have startups and uh, certainly we we have faced uh, that challenge and the way that we have um in addition to to getting to this point which is um bootstrapping but also um in this country they have an r&d uh investment um fund um which has got us to this point and now we're about to um open for an investment round so but you know there there are many challenges as being a founder because you obviously have to do um you know many tasks within the startup um and you know there's also um with the the growth of the company we have in our sector quite a significant amount of uh customer awareness that we need to provide and right. having a b2c model which is what we have which because we've done that because we want to um have health tech through the customer lens but right. building it out so that um partners can come on board um and you know we can have a b2b to c but essentially you know it's providing something for people to start collecting and engaging with their health yeah but um 
you know, it's, I guess, I think that the, you know, besides funding, I think consumer or customer awareness are our two significant problems. Right, right. Thank you. Uh, Lisa, you are into uh, medical devices or in design innovation. So apart from customer awareness, so we have established one thing with all our previous three speakers and customer awareness is a challenge when you're coming out in the market with a very innovative concept or product yes. in a usual space. So what were, what have been your challenges as a design innovator in terms of uh, funding or creating multiple prototypes? How was it for you? You know, I think there's a lot of challenges when you when you're doing a startup and those challenges are kind of ever evolving and ever changing. But one that's been a bit consistent um, has definitely been funding. Funding is always a challenge and you're constantly seeking the next funding. Um, but I think apart from that, uh, creating awareness is very hard. And especially, I think in healthcare, when you're an unknown entity, you know, you need to build trust. There's a lot of activities that needs to, to take place. Uh, we started off in the kind of B2C market, selling mostly directly to end consumers. Uh, and there, definitely, when you're an unknown company, the, there is an element of who are you and, you know, why would I trust your solution? Um, and then now we're also working more in the kind of reimbursement area, like seeking reimbursement in, in various countries. Um, and that's, that, you know, that's a very let's say long route to take, you need to be very patient because each system has its own requirement. There's a lot of uh, things to consider like that. Um, so I think there's, there's a constant, you know, growing element of challenges, but definitely I think the overarching ones for us have been funding and then uh, generating sales as well and, and the appropriate traction. Right, right. So um, thank you so much, Lisa, for your answer. Uh, we have a lot of questions on funding, but I think I'll take questions later. Uh, funding or bootstrapping, which, uh, I mean, what works the best for your company? So I think just uh, one line answer on funding, getting funded is better or working and developing your product while you're bootstrapped is better. What would you say, Rachna? Just one, one sentence. Rachna, I raised points. So it's not which way you are. <laughs> yeah, no, but I think that's why she has the yeah. foreign experience to share. So I think very pertinent question. If you are in the beta phase or when you are doing a MVP, minimum viable product, I think it's important to first clearly know what you're offering, right? Right. Uh, right to be at the right place at the right time. I think that's the statement I would say even when it comes to funding. So after your MVP stage, when you know that it is going to address a sizable portion of the market and you need funds for what purpose? You need funds for marketing, for building a team, for infrastructure, for inventory, supply chain, whatever be that. I think once you are clear, then going out there and seeking funds, because uh, it's also bringing on board growth partners, not just investors. It's also somebody right. who has the shared vision of your company to take it to the level that you plan to. So bootstrapping up to a certain stage and then very clearly going out there, pitch, pitch, pitch until you get your right partner. Until you get a right partner who shares your vision. Yes. And passion for the business. Yes. Uh, Ms. Anu, what do you think? Because you've been uh, definitely bootstrapping. Bootstrap. I, bootstrap. Uh, I think if you get a partner, uh, then make sure that it's either a lot of money or a lot of time, uh, because or both. <laughs> I think then I think it makes sense because if you don't have the right partner who doesn't have the patience, I think spending more time with the partner than with the product. Uh, or if you have a lot of money and a lot of time, that's the ideal situation, which doesn't happen. Uh, so I think if we can bootstrap, get it to a stage where you can generate revenues and then raise money, I think it's much easier. Right. right. Uh, Marie, what about you? Getting funded uh, because you I've, are in between of raising a fund, right? Yeah, and I, and I guess I'm at that stage now where you know we're we're scaling. So we've um, you know we've uh, bootstrapped. Uh, First MVP and then into really the the product market fit um, 
spent time uh, understanding our customers and connecting with our customers. And now we uh, and trialing and 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 um, and working together on the messaging for customer awareness. Right. And so now we have uh, you know a valid solution for investment, right? It, it's the it's the right time. It's everyone's talking about health tech. There's definitely a need for you know reducing healthcare costs for both consumers and for the system. Um, and so. It's it's about being in the right place, and and we feel with that we're there uh, now, and and uh, we're ready to go. So I think uh, you know both have their places, and also I believe to um, get exposed to volume people, uh, it's quite a big problem. You know, it's healthcare yeah. is bigger than us, right? So I think that you know having uh, investment is only going to help. Um, have large attraction which is obviously what we want to do if we have a big vision to be able to help you know millions of people um or billions over a big period of time then you know that's what we need to have investment for is to have that impact on billions of people with chronic illness and that's certainly my vision right so for you scalability has to be the core reason for raising funds to reach out to people yeah uh, Lisa what about you bootstrapping or getting funded there's definitely pros and cons to both I would say I think it depends a little bit on the area you're in but I think I would echo what some of the others have said uh, especially for healthcare. Um, if you can get kind of funds that come along with experience and input and advice that is probably a good route to pursue um, if it's funds and only funds, you maybe want to consider whether you truly need it or not. But mm-hmm. I think if you can get people on board who can open doors and who are in it with you, that is very powerful. Uh, I think also for raising further investment rounds, it's very good to even have a, a small round in the beginning where at least you show that you're getting somewhere. But in healthcare, you know, it, it costs a lot of money, especially yes. in hardware as well. So you know, you'd be, you'd come have to come from a, a great background, perhaps to be able to, to bootstrap all the way, because it's, we may be talking, you know, millions of, of euros, if you want to do clinical trials, and so on. Uh, unless, of course, if you can do everything on grants. But I think a, a combination, um, a combination is good. Right. When getting grants, there is a process of getting grants. And of course, it's not, it's not going to roll in, uh, very fast. You have to spend time, invest time in identifying right grants for you. So I think, yeah. Jatin, shall we yeah, uh, go to questions or one more question? Yes, okay. Ria, One more my question or audience questions? We, we take up one question from Ria and then you ask your question. Uh, Ria had asked about, I wanted to know a little more about the current and future market of telehealth. Yes, and yes, yes. In US it is prevalent, in India it is picking up, but what are your views on that? So anyone who would want to pick that up? Anu? About the telehealth and telemedicine. Like, what what was the question again? Uh, I wanted to know a little. Uh, Ria had asked this question. I wanted she has given a little context about why she is asking this question. But I wanted to know a little about the current and future market of telehealth and telemedicine. Right. Um, Hang on. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Yes. Y- y- yes, Mary. You want to respond to that? Uh, I guess uh, what we've seen globally is obviously an expansion of telehealth uh, everywhere, um, you know, due to COVID, uh, obviously. So, but um, I, th- I think some countries, people have been a little bit disappointed um, with what actually telehealth meant because um, some people thought the telehealth was going to be virtual visits. But in many countries, it's it's ended up being phone calls, right? And so the the solutions that that uh, many digital health companies provided for telehealth weren't having the take up that they wanted straight away. But but I think uh, at least we've started, and I, there seems to be so many benefits to to uh, virtual health. Um, and I think now's the time during COVID to to actually to uh, all of us work together on you know, on ways that we can use the virtual health. Um, As a consumer product, 
we provided a, um, an, a health history export for consumers. So if they want to provide the health history and then our telehealth um, phone call or, or a um, virtual call, they can upload the history. So there's just simple things, um, but I think it's uh, definitely on the up. Um, all right. Uh, I think also, uh, Krishna, you want to respond to that? Also, there is this project Step One, which is getting quite popular in India. Yeah. It was started yeah. by a group of volunteers, and they were able to partner with government. So, with government machinery support, they are able to get a lot of get a lot of traction. Uh, right. Anu has to leave. So, Anu, thank you so much for joining in. Uh, uh, yeah, Rachna, you want to. This, yes, Anu, you, want, you were saying. Thank you so much, Anu, for being part of this conversation. Thank you. Sorry, I have to leave for another. Thank yeah. you. Thank okay. you. Rasna, you want to respond to that? Then, Kritika, then you'll start with your thing then. Rasna. Are you, are you saying with reference to the telemedicine? Yeah. 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 In yeah, India. So just building upon what Marie just spoke, I think it's there's a lot of traction, right? Uh, today, one is obviously thanks to COVID, the entire dynamics has changed. But I think there's been an evolution here and uh, content and explaining to people the why, what and how uh, of every medical problem and then the subsequent solution to it, I think has played a big role in establishing the credibility of telehealth and telemedicine. At least that's been our learning, right? So one is you just go out there and push products uh, to consumers. But when you understand what really the consumers are looking for and take into account, like we just spoke about customer awareness, I would take it a step further and say, take into account what are the kind of apprehensions, what are the objections uh, that they have and you address those that's when I think a brand's credibility gets established. Um, so it's more value-driven, it's trust-based, and it's very, very focused on efficacy. Right. I think if you have clinical trials to support, if you have any kind of uh, consumer awareness that has happened, and if you're able to publish that research and those papers, then uh, there is going to be a boom. At least that's our personal experience uh, at Gynoveda because it's very heartening to see telemedicine booming in even tier five and tier six cities of India. Actually, these are, I would say, these are rural villages which have exploded thanks to Geo. They've got access to smartphones, Broadband, Facebook yes, on their internet. feed. Right. But um, uh, telemedicine is about keeping authenticity and accessibility and making it affordable to people. So if you have the three A's, I would actually sum it up as the three A's, being authentic, uh, accessible, and affordable. Uh, thank you, uh, Rachna, for that uh, question. I think, Jatin, we have one more question again on uh, regulatory compliances. Rachna, it's again to you because it's about digitization in India. What regulatory compliances does Gynoveda comply with? This question has been, uh, been asked by Mr. Anupam. One of okay. our viewers, Mr. Anupam. Sure. Okay, so there are three specific regulatory compliances. One is under the larger purview of being uh, a digital platform, which is into selling Ayurveda medicines. We come under the purview of Ayush Ministry certification. So that's a longer purview. The second right. is you need to be compliant on FSSAI, which is Food right. Safety uh, Act. So that's very important. And the third is GMP, which is good manufacturing practices, because you need to be sure about the potency and purity of your herbal ingredients that's getting inside each of the bottles that's being sent out. So we are we are compliant on all the three mandatory regulations. Uh, and it's extremely important that you, at an early stage itself, you get all these compliances into place, because then you can focus in a very undivided way on growth, on customer um, efficacy and retention. Right. Thank you, Arachna, for your response. Uh, my next question is to Marie. Marie, what do you see, like we are uh, near to our uh, conversation being concluded. So what are those uh, trends that you see uh, globally in terms of health tech? What are the new upcoming trends which you will see booming? Of course, post pandemic, there will be some impact. So what do you think? Uh, well, I, obviously, um, obviously telehealth uh, is, is happening. That's um, 
but but also self-monitoring. And that's definitely the space we're in uh, and also wearables. Um, mm. th I think they're the, the, the three trends that, that, are, that are being talked about. Um, and obviously remote testing as well as another one. Um, Femtech is obviously, yeah, Femtech is also uh, growing. Uh, I think, you know, we, we, we have the, the cat out of the bag now where we're, we're talking about women's health mm. and women are taking those, thinking about the problems that we have and the, the awareness of, of uh, the chronic conditions that women have and actually being empowered to go out and find solutions. So, you know, the, I think it's quite amazing. So there's definitely quite a lot of growth in those four or five areas. Uh, Nisa, what do you think? What would be the new next uh, big trend or big boom in health tech industry? Hello, Nisa, are you? Sorry, sorry, I was just muted. I just need to find the button. I think uh, telehealth is obviously a big growing area, especially with the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. I think that's going to be uh, taking off much more than we've seen so far. Uh, I hope so as well. I think it's, um, you know, there's been some barriers, I think, to uptake in some healthcare systems of new methods sometimes. And I think that that's been kind of forced upon the healthcare system a little bit in this situation. And maybe that's been a, a kind of good thing, that, that part. Uh, so I do think that that is go going to be growing. And, and along with that, obviously, kind of remote monitoring and all of that um, will become even more important than it has been so far. Right, right. What about uh, development on product innovation front or design innovation front? What, what should be our takeaways? Because you are a design innovator. What should be our takeaways from this pandemic in product innovation or design innovation? I think um, it shows the need to, to, to move fast and to, um, to act quickly. Um, and that's something, I guess, uh, doesn't necessarily correlate so well with healthcare always. Um, but in, in design innovation, the idea is always to to try things very quickly, try, does this have merit? Should this work? Uh, yeah. And then you work on it more um, to develop it. And, and the philosophy is also to design with the user in mind, to design around the user, rather than having a technology and then try to fit it into a scenario, which can, can be how some things are, are brought into the world. Um, so that those kinds of things are, I think going to, to be changing a little bit so how we work. Rapid adaptation trial and then deciding whether to go ahead with, with it or not. I so, hope so, yes. Yes, uh, I think, uh, Jatin, we I don't think we have more questions coming in. Or uh, I wanted to ask you a question, Krutika. Uh, oh, you, sure. In a way, you are building a business, uh, yes. which is a community driven, where you are able to interact with a lot of other health tech founders. Yes. So what are the trends you are seeing? That you know, what kind of new solutions that people are able to build? Right. What what are the trends you are seeing? Uh, so the kind of trends that I see uh, is uh, apart from telehealth because it's been already discussed. Uh, we'll be having uh, more focus on preventive care in India, which is I will talk for uh, Indian market because people are now realizing the importance of immunity. So you have so many products these days. And I think Rachna will agree that how immunity is that one word which has uh, really boosted upon people are using it for breads and khakras. And Everything is immunity now. booster now. <laughs> yes. So uh, apart from, let's say, rapid testing, remote testing, uh, which is again in the space of preventive care. Diagnostics isn't part of preventive care and then it leads to therapy. So I see that preventive care um, will be the next uh, area where health tech has to move because people are understanding gradually how would how prevention is better than cure. We used to just say this hypothetically, but now with the cost of pandemic, people are realizing the actual cost of life. So that and even the governments are getting more proactive. Uh, as somebody says, cost of resource and cost of healthcare. So even the system is now driven to reduce the load on it on itself. And which is why uh, uh, there will be a lot of innovations even in healthcare delivery methods with this. 
Awesome. Baki, awesome. Baki sare points already they have been discussed like variables and <laughs> we, like, awesome. So, so we uh, we have a hard stop at six fifty five. So last two three minutes of this particular session. Uh, so at seven pm uh, we have a ad tech session and uh, investors from Europe will be joining in. So if you go to coreisummit dot com you will discover a lot of good. Uh, so, so at this time we had speakers from Australia. We moved to UK barely. <laughs> then move, we will move to the other side of the, the other side of the globe. <laughs> Uh, uh, Nathan is so, doing promotion for the next session in this session. I can see that. <laughs> yes, Smart. Because every session will have attack ones, and we have attack panel going on. So another right. thing, uh, and I, I will share the LinkedIn thread where all these speakers are uh, tagged. So in case if you want to ask more questions which you are not able yes. to pick, you can ask on the LinkedIn. Uh, yes. Another thing we want to do is we want to end sessions on a high. Uh, so this is what we try to do. Where think of this as a university class, and now it's a convocation time, and you are invited as a chief guest, and you are supposed to give one line convocation speech. In the context of health tech or whatever you would want to mention, uh, so when the last speaker uh, ends their sentence, I'll end the call. So we'll end on a high uh, because this ending Zoom calls is a very awkward thing. So one by one, uh, I'll ask, and then the moment uh, Rashna, you go last because we started with you. And the moment you end your sentence, I'll end the call. Uh, Lisa, uh, Lisa, uh, what is your one-line message or one-line convocation message for everyone? I think for potential future entrepreneurs who are listening in today. Uh, the main thing is to to really have drive and passion about what you're doing because I think it's a it's a hard route and there will be obstacles and challenges. So I think it's it's really uh, so important to have that and to have kind of people surrounding you who will who will kind of help you on this journey, whether it's emotional support or other types of support. So that's that would be my advice. Awesome, uh, Marie, uh, your one line convocation message for everyone. <laughs> Talk, talk to your customers because you're solving the problem to them. And uh, we, we have design meetings with our customers and they just can't believe it. They, they just love it. Awesome. Uh, Krutika? Right. Okay. So trust yourself, hustle hard, and be ready to pivot whenever required. That <laughs> is with reference to what uh, Marie also said. Listen to your customers. Mm. Awesome. Thank you so much, everyone, and Vadwani Foundation team for supporting this. Rachna, uh, Rachna, Rege. No, no. So I'll, uh, I'll do. He's timing it. Before, before final announcement, oh. I want to plug in. If I, as because she speaks, no one will listen to the announcements. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so thank you so much, everyone, for joining in. Rachna, you end your sentence, and I'll end the call. <laughs> okay. I think I'll just, uh, you know, taking cues from everyone. Resilience is the key. I think COVID has taught us that, that if you're resilient, you are ready to take on any challenge or crisis that's coming your way. I'm just going to end on our favorite song, which is Apna Time Aega. Uh, so that's something <laughs> that we should all remember. And uh, yeah, uh, thank you once again awesome. for having me. Thank you so much.